All right, good evening, everyone. I know it's hot out there, but it's nice and cool in here. We get to enjoy the AC and continue our study uh, looking at the attributes of God and asking the question, what is God like? Let's pray. Father, we come before you thankful for every opportunity that we have to look at your word. And as you express to us who you are in your character and your nature, we ask that you would help us um, to grow in our understanding. Uh, So much of your character and nature causes us to scratch our head and then lift our hands to the heavens and rejoice that though we are finite, you are the infinite God that is worthy of our worship. And we thank you for that reality. So as we Consider even the scriptures alone that we're going to read together. Uh, They bring joy to my heart. And I ask that you would bless this class and our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I made good on my promise. And this week we are today, we are looking at um, the attribute of God's omnipresence. Now, last week we were supposed to look at omnipresence, uh, but I was terribly unprepared. I looked at my notes and I was overwhelmed. I needed to edit. I needed to to take away a lot of uh, the organization that was just a mess. But we talked about the omniscience of God last Wednesday, that God is all knowing. So when we look at the omniscience of God, the omnipresence of God, the omnipotence of God, uh, we are considering that Latin word omni, which just means all. So today when we say about God, that God is omni present, we mean that he is all present. And this is important as we have talked about each week, because I believe that A.W. Tozer was right, that that what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us, because it it affects our our worldview. It affects our perspective. It it not only affects how we see God, it affects the the way that we see ourself. It, It affects the way that we see our neighbor. It affects the way that we view our world. And we want to view our world through the lens of the scripture and we want to meditate on God's character and nature so that it might affect our prayers practically because as we learn more about God the more we know the more that we love God and the more that we love God the more we desire to obey God And as we're praying to our God, we are, our mind is expanded and our praise and adoration for the God that we're communicating with grows, right? Because especially as we consider today's attribute, we're reminded of something that we need to hear. And that's God is all present, He is all present just as God is unlimited or infinite with respect to time. So God is unlimited with respect to space. His characteristics of God's, the characteristics of God's nature um, is called, this characteristic of God's nature is called his omnipresence, right? So, God does not have size or spatial dimensions and is present at every point of space. Get this, with his whole being, his whole being, yet God acts differently in different places. So one pastor pointed out 
that he, what humbles him is just thinking that, that often we can be present somewhere. We can show up, but we're not really here, right? Our, our mind is off somewhere else. We can't even say it, it, for us that our whole being is somewhere in the sense that our, our mind is fully there, right? Sometimes we find ourselves off somewhere else in our mind. So remember, God is not like that. It's not like he has one foot in the present space with us and one foot out because he has no spatial dimensions, right? He is infinite. So our main text for God's omnipresence is Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10, where we read, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. It was brought to my attention this week that the psalmist is actually giving us here in this psalm a metaphor when it comes to the directional dimensions of God's presence, right? So this isn't a metaphor. God's all present, but here's what's really interesting. Um, When he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, heaven is where? It's due north, Right? So there's a directional metaphor here. Right? If, if I go due north, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, the grave, that is south, due south, you are there. And then he says, if I take the wings of the morning, Right, talking about the sunrise. The sunrise is in the east. He is there. And then he says, If I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Now, in Jerusalem, the Mediterranean Sea from Jerusalem is in the west. So the psalmist is drawing our attention to the fact that whatever direction you go, God's presence is there. There's no escaping the presence of the Lord. In fact, what's really interesting is is if we didn't have the second part of this verse, it would sound haunting. Right? It has this tone to it. When we first start, we're in the questions, the rhetorical questions that he asks, where we said, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. It's, it's, it's a haunting kind of tone. <laughs> but then he says, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there and you see this call to look at the comfort that God's presence brings to our heart your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me so our definition for the omnipresence or the all presence of God um, I believe this is Wayne Grudem's definition Um, God does not have size or spatial dimensions and is present at every point of space with his whole being. Yet God acts differently in different places. To put it another way, God is always present everywhere. You can tell that's my definition right there, right? God is always present everywhere. 
Here's our first takeaway, and this is an encouragement we need to hear because our circumstances can rob us. Our feelings can deceive us and draw us away from this incredibly comforting biblical reality. Our first takeaway is that God's presence is a fact, not a feeling. God's presence is a fact, not a feeling. If God said it, God will do it. And what we see in the scriptures is that by his word, he reminds us that his presence is not a feeling. It is rooted in the fact of him informing us that he is omnipresent, that he is the God who is always present everywhere. (laughs) Two things this truth brings to bear on our heart. One, God's presence is comforting, but the second thing it brings to bear is God's presence is convicting. Right? God's presence is comforting. It brings comfort and it brings also with it conviction. See, God's presence being uh, brings us both comfort and conviction. It assures us that God is there in our adversity and holds us accountable for our actions. For there is nothing that happens away from his sight. We would be wise to meditate on that reality every day. That nothing happens away from his sight. So we're going to look at two categories as we consider God's presence. I had three and I was overcomplicating things. So let's just keep it simple. All right. And we're going to consider God's unseen presence. And we're going to also consider God's unlimited presence presence. Um, Theologians who like to use big words will call this God's transcendence, meaning that God goes above and beyond time and space, and God's imminence, that God is near, that God is close. So God is both transcendent, and he is a God who is imminent. So God's unseen presence presence. (laughs) To help us frame these two realities, God is transcendent and God is imminent, I want us to consider our second takeaway. There is a place God is, or there is a place God is where we are not. So there is a place where God is and we are not. But there is nowhere that we are where God is not. So God's transcendence, there is a place God is where we are not. We're not there. But there is nowhere that we are where God is not. So where is this place that God is that we are not? Well, Psalm 123 verse 1 says, Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in where? The heavens. Right? So, so where is God? The heavens, which means the heights. The heights. The heights of heights. That's where God is. So that is where God is, that we are not. He's transcendent. There is a dimension, a spiritual dimension that we do not see where God is. He's transcendent. We see this in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year of King King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Right? So this is a vision from the prophet where he saw God in this place where he is. 
where his throne is, high and lifted up. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2, it's got some practical weight to it as well. He says, do not be rash with your mouth. Do not let your heart utter anything hastily before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Right? That is a reminder that God is high and lifted up, that he is in the heavens. Therefore, we should be careful in how we speak to him. Right? With reverence and respect. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. The um, the Apostle John speaking from Patmos as he gives the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. So that is God's unseen presence. But let's talk about God's unlimited presence, and if He is not only transcendent, but He is also imminent, if He is everywhere, right, without spatial dimension, This means Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 39 through 40. I think that that this this is a, a great broad statement for us that helps us remember that he is Lord above and Lord um, at hand when he says, Therefore, know this day and consider in your heart, meditate, that the Lord Himself is God in heaven above and on earth. Beneath, there is no other. There is no other. But this one is my favorite. This one is my favorite. Isaiah 57, 15a, the first part of the verse, says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits, where? Eternity. Whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. That's amazing. That's amazing. So our takeaway, God is transcendent and imminent. What do we mean by that? Well, there is a place. God is where we are not. But there is nowhere that we are where God is not. And this for the believer For us today, when we go to God in prayer, it's an incredible comfort. God's presence is a comfort for us. The second part of our verse in Isaiah 57, 15, it finishes by saying this, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him, with him, who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. God is near the humble. That's a comfort to us as believers that he desires to revive our heart. Psalm chapter 23, just verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He is with us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
Now, when I was at the Bible college, I had the opportunity to take Greek 1 and 2. So I audited Greek because I had a sneaking suspicion that it wouldn't click naturally. And I was wise in knowing myself. I give myself an F. But my brother-in-law just got through Greek 1 and 2. And he is so excited to share certain insights that, um, that are valuable and bring comfort. And, and something that he shared just recently as he talked about this text is he said the grammatical structure in this text, in the Greek, because remember, um, they wouldn't use an explanation point, so they would use something different to emphasize a point. Right? So if you were going to, in the most wooden, literal way, translate what this verse is saying, it uses five negatives. So it would read literally, I will never, never leave you, nor will I ever, ever, ever forsake you. Right? Right? Man, what an incredible encouragement to us. That God's presence, and get this, in the context of that verse, what's it talking about? It's talking about contentment. Right? It says, hey, stop, stop desiring the things that you don't have. But instead, what is the cure for covetousness? Contentment in the presence of God. The God who will never, never leave you and never, never, never forsake you. So God's presence brings comfort to our soul. But God's presence also brings conviction. And we see this clearly in the scripture. Jeremiah chapter 23 Verse 23 through 24 says, I, uh, Am I a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God f- afar off? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? So it's a reminder that God's omnipresence means that since he is present everywhere at all times, there is nothing that escapes his sight, that there is nothing that's hidden from his view. I know that every pastor who has a toddler shares this story, but it is quite funny that when you are teaching your kid how to play hide and seek, they only know one hiding place. (laughs) And it's the hiding place that you first showed them. So they go back to the same one again and again and again. And that's what they think the game is. And in the same way, if we are trying to cover and hide our sin from God, who sees all and knows all, we are as silly as my toddler trying to hide from God. For for me in the same place, but for us to hide from God, right? It's, It's silly, to think that we could escape his presence. There is nowhere that God is not. Nothing happens outside of his sight or away from his ear. There is nothing that we do. There is nothing that we say. There is nothing that we think that goes outside of what God sees and what God knows. Amos chapter 9, verses 2 through 4. Not one of them shall flee away. Not one of them shall escape. Though they dig into Sheol, the grave, from there shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel Mountain, From there I will search out and take them. And though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. There is nowhere 
that we could hide from his presence. Revelation chapter 14 reminds us of this reality that as we've read two verses right now, or in the, just now we read um, that, that we cannot escape God's presence even in the grave. Um, Psalm 139, even if I might, might make my bed in the grave, right? Some translations is, is hell, right? Um, we, we need to remember that even God is present in hell, right? God is present in hell. There is nowhere his presence is not. And we see a glimpse of this in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 10. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Listen to this. In the presence of of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. All right? It's just my phone vibrating, guys. Thank you. Right? So, God is present even as we see here in Revelation chapter 9 through 10 in hell. And if you're thinking to yourself as a astute Bible student, well, <laughs> Pastor Schuyler, what about uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, where it clearly says here, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So right here in the text, it says, that they will be put away from the presence of God. So, so how, how do we reconcile these two things? By remembering that when we read the presence of the Lord here, it's talking about God's countenance, right? It's talking about his eye, his face. So it is that we know in hell that God is turning his face away, and there is no grace that is extended to those who are receiving everlasting wrath. Right? They are experiencing God's presence, but they're experiencing God's wrath. They're experiencing his holiness. They're experiencing his just judgments. But he has turned his face, they have been removed from the presence of his countenance. And even the common graces, the things that are good, that right now the wicked, the unbeliever experiences good gifts from God that remind humanity that God is good and he loves the world. And because he loves the world, and because he is good, the, the rain falls on the righteous and the wicked. But in hell, even those common graces that are experienced now from the, for the saved and the unsaved will be removed in hell. It's a convicting reality. It's a reminder that there is no hiding from God's presence. That God's presence is a fact, not a feeling. But I do want to remind you of our second takeaway. That though it is extremely convicting for the one who does not know Jesus, for the one who God graciously is calling now to repentance. For the believer, for the one who trusts in Christ and has had their sins forgiven 
have removed as far as the east is from the west. We are drawn into God's heart and reminded that his presence is a great and everlasting comfort and a refuge for our soul. Let's pray. (laughs) Father, we ask that you would continue to help us to draw close to you in acknowledging your presence. That each and every day we would remind ourselves of the good news that even when our circumstances make us feel like we're in the dark and we're away from you, that you are near. That you are not a God who is far off, but you are a God who will never leave us and never forsake us. We thank you for this incredible blessing. We thank you for the joy of our salvation. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who rescued and ransomed sinners like me and my friends here. And we ask that you would use us to proclaim this good news to our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, our loved ones who do not know you, (coughs) that you would open their eyes and their ears to the wonderful reality of knowing you. In Jesus' name, amen.